All right. Uh, I took a question last time on, on hyperbolic trig and kind of like what even is uh, cinch and cosh. And I realized that, you know, it's not something that we really address in our, our standard math classes, so I might as well address it in this one. Um, but I'm not going to include this on like the multivariable calculus playlist because there's not going to be really any calculus or multiple variables. So I'm going to start off telling you about what you already know, um, and that's circular trig, like, you know, regular cosine and regular sine. I've got these posters I don't really need right now. So let me draw you the diagram. So we've got ourselves, you know, like a unit circle, and we had you know, let's see, some kind of like angle theta. And we knew that the coordinates of this point were cosine theta and sine theta. Spent like a whole semester in pre-calculus investigating this whole situation. So yes, that was great, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, now what I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to draw now is, and oh, and of course, because this had a length of one, this curve here was the, you know, the curve given by x squared plus y squared is equal to one. That's going to be relevant. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the unit hyperbola. And without going in and drawing, you know, the diagonal asymptotes and everything, I'm going to just go at it. I think that's a pretty good one. Okay, this is over here, but we're not going to really need it for our discussion. Uh, this is the graph of x squared minus y squared equals 1. All right, and so what's going to happen is, you know, we're going to kind of in a similar sense, I'm going to have, you know, like a point here on the unit hyperbola its coordinates are going to be hyperbolic cosine of t and hyperbolic sine of t. Now, I'll be calling them cosh and cinch, you know, the rest of the way through. Um, some people call it cosh, but, you know, I don't know, the first time I heard of it, they called it cosh, so I don't know, called it cosh my whole life. Um, there is also, like, tanch, uh, like hyperbolic tangent, which would be, as you might expect, hyperbolic sine divided by hyperbolic cosine. Uh, there's also, you know, hyperbolic secant, cosecant, and cotangent and stuff, and those would all be, you know, exactly what you would expect. But the question is, like, what does this T represent here? Okay. Um, and I think I might actually come back to that. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to just kind of jump over to the other side of this board, and I'm going to show you something that... I think I may have mentioned before, but I don't know that I've ever done for y'all. We definitely did, never had any need to do this in, in the AP Calculus class. But I'm proposing that any function, um, I guess, that has a, you know, a large enough domain can be written as the sum of an even and an odd function. Okay, this is the thing that I had not seen before, before this morning or before a couple days ago um, on, on the Internet. And I really like this. Um, I've seen this trick used to solve other types of problems in other situations, but I, I thought this was nice. So I'm just going to just kind of give you this identity. f of x is going to be equal to half of f of x plus f of negative x plus half of f of x minus f of negative x. And I, I don't know, just writing this down, this makes me think of uh, this girl that was in my class a few years ago, and she was really, I don't know why, she's really into even and odd functions. Came from a different country, and maybe that was uh, like really, um, really emphasized there, but I, I just feel like, like, you know, Athena, you would love this. Um, somewhere out there, probably somewhere in California now. All right, but what I need to tell you is that this is an even function. And this is an odd function in the sense that an even function is symmetric around the y-axis that, um, you know, uh, function g is even if g of x is equal to g of negative x. Well, if you replace x with negative x, well, you have the same thing. And then an odd function 
is the type of thing that if you replace x with negative x, you get the opposite of what you had before. Okay, it's symmetric across the origin. That say g of negative x is the negative of g of regular x. Okay, so what I'm going to do, we could apply this to e to the x. e to the x is the type of function that you know we work with all the time. Um, we worked with it a whole bunch last year. It's it's very interesting for a variety of reasons. Like, you know, the slope of the tangent line is its y coordinate, or the amount of area underneath it is also related to its y coordinate. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Okay, so I'm going to write e to the x as half of e to the x plus e to the negative x plus half of e to the x minus e to the negative x. And, you know, some people would take uh, this to be the definition of cosh and cinch. Okay? So that's kind of one of our fundamental identities is the cosh t plus cinch t is going to equal e to the t. It's like, okay, how does that have to do with the, with the unit hyperbola? That's, that's an interesting question. Okay, so, you know, as a definition, this is what I would call cosh x, and this is what I would call cinch x. else did I want to say about that? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to, you know, and getting towards what does this t represent, I want to talk about where, does, where do they start. We know what happens at theta equals zero. We start down here. But, you know, are we going to start here for this one? Are we going to start elsewhere? Are we going to start up at the, t you know, who knows? And so I think this is something we can kind of come to naturally. So based on this definition, you know, let's think about cosh of zero. It's going to be half of 1 plus 1, right? e to the 0 being 1, and that'll be 1. Okay, well, that's, that's kind of promising. It's a kind of comforting, right? We know the cosine of 0 is 1. Cosh 0, also 1. Okay, so we'll look at what happens when I plug in 0 to cinch. I'll have 1 minus 1 is going to be 0 divided by 2 is going to be 0. Okay, so this is good. So cinch of 0 is going to be half of 1 minus 1, which is 0. So notice, OK, this is going to be the place where t is equal to 0. I'll tell you that as t increases, we're going to go up along this way. You know, positive t's are going to go up along that, uh, uh, along that kind of section of the hyperbola. And negative t's are going to go down that way. Okay, there was. I don't remember what it was. Oh, it was some kind of like parametric equation situation in pre-calculus, or maybe calculus, I don't remember, that was tracing along a hyperbola that at some point it actually jumped from that back over to here. I found that kind of strange. Um, but that, that's, that's not relevant to our discussion of, of this hyperbola. OK, so what I'm telling you that t represents is it's like an area. Okay. And, but I'm also proposing that this is actually the exact same as the circular trig case. So what t is, is it's half of, wait, no, this area is half of t. So t is twice this amount of area that I'm going to shade in in red. So that, that area is equal to t, half of t. Okay. But what I'm also proposing is, and I, I mean, in doing this, I may have, oh, I know what I'll do. Um, I'm going to actually move this down a little bit so that it's not encapsulating so much area because I'm telling you that it's actually the same thing up there. So I'm just going to move my point a little more over here so I don't have to, you know, shade so much of this board. Um, and, but, you know, kind of the same idea. And I'm going to say that, you know, I'm proposing that this amount of area is also half theta. Okay, why is that the case? So we think about from geometry class how we found the area of a portion of a circle. Is we said that the portion of the angle divided by 360 is what we would do on pi r squared. 
Okay. Well, first of all, on this circle, r is 1. So I don't even have to worry about r squared. So think about, you know, what out of 2 pi? Theta divided by 2 pi. Maybe I'll even write this down. Mm, yeah. Area equals theta divided by 2 pi, the proportion of pi r squared. Well, we know that r is 1 in this case, and I can cancel the thing. So this is area is equal to theta divided by 2, which is area is half theta. Okay, so this is what theta really was representing all along, or could have been interpreted that way, right? It's the amount of area over here on this unit circle. In the same way that this is, you know, related to the amount of area trapped between the straight line that goes from the origin to this and, you know, above the hyperbola. Okay. So that's kind of what this, uh, this parameter T represents. What else did I have to say about this? All right. Um, so that T is the X value or no? No, Koch is going to be the X value. Um, question is, is t going to be the x value? Um, t is somehow this amount of area that's going to get bigger the farther out along the hyperbola that you go. Um, and we can make that t as, as large as we like. And we can also make t as negative as we like by somehow considering this to be negative area down here, which I think, you know, being veterans of a single variable calculus class, you can relate to allowing for an area to be negative. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to sketch the graph of cinch and Koch um, kind of based on this. Um, and then maybe I'll you know, erase this because I've got a couple more properties and then just, all, just a couple of trivia facts that I want to tell you. I've got all these things that I, um, so many things I want to tell you um, about hyperbolic trig. But I guess I, uh, I think I'll start by talking about the, the graphs. And, okay, so cosh of zero is equal to one, okay? But it's also equal to half of e to the x plus e to the negative x. And I want you to just really think about, you know, maybe imagine that you took like all of the small values of x and just like ignored them. And think about what's happening when x is really large. Um, as x gets really large in the positive direction, e to the negative x goes towards zero. So on the right side, this more or less looks like one half e to the x. And it might start a little slower, but you know, it, we're gonna have exponential growth. But then off to the left, I'm gonna have exponential growth again, because as x goes to negative infinity, that's going towards zero, and I have e to the e to the infinity, or you know, it's something like e to the negative, or think about the graph of y equals e to the negative x. It's exponential decay, it's gonna come down like that. And so it's over here. And then there, more evidence that coach is an even function, right? It's got this symmetry to it. Um, this is not a, not a good drawing, but I will tell you that um, another idea of the graph of, of Koch is, um, you know, you got like a wire hanging. That's going to be in the shape of, uh, you know, some kind of transformed Koch graph. Um, just have to mention that. So... And then since, yeah, I'll draw you a picture of that. I'm going to need a little more, a little bit of negative y region. So. Okay. As x goes towards infinity, this is 1 half e to the x again. This is, you know, yeah, 1 half x. But wait a second. What is cinch of 0? Cinch of 0 is 0, so I need to be careful and, and put that there. Um, but, you know, as x goes towards infinity, this is going to track towards 1 half e to the x. So it's going to have aspects of exponential growth up here. But as x goes towards negative infinity, this will go towards 0, and I'll have, like, negative 1 half e to the negative x. So it's like exponential decay, but, uh, but negative. So it's going to end up going, like, And this is the graph of y equals cinch. Um, I'm sure we could go and we could think about um, what the graph of tanch looks like. I think, yeah, okay, somebody, somebody in the crowd is suggesting, yes, it's got a double horizontal asymptote, doesn't it? 
I can I can just see how this is going to happen um, because the e to the x and the e to the negative x. It's honestly it's a it's a precal problem. Um, the the asymptotes of of tanch. That's or the multiple asymptotes of horizontal asymptotes of tanch. That's interesting. Yeah, and that's something that you know you could investigate yourself. But I don't think that's going to provide any more value to this video. And I'm you know, I don't know 15 minutes. It's not that long. But I've still got a few more things to say. Um, all right, so I think what I want to do is I want to talk about the arc length property. Um, the arc length integral, I don't know if y'all remember from AP Calculus last year, I, it was pretty hopeless. Um, oh yeah, there's one, one more thing I'm going to need to say before I, before I do the arc length problem. Um, it was pretty hopeless to actually compute these integrals by hand because the, the integral was the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared and just the odds of being able to add one to the square of a thing and have it come back being a perfect square, it was just like, just not gonna happen. Um, but there is an identity that I need to, that I need to kind of, um, I need to throw out there. Um, and it's related to the fact that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one because of this, right? So this is cosine squared theta plus, sine squared theta equals one. The equivalent down here, because we're on the, um, we're on the hyperbola x squared minus y squared equals one, and x is equal to cosh, cosh t, and uh, y is equal to sinh t, that means that cosh squared t minus sinh squared t is equal to one for any t. And this will be something that will help me actually compute this arc length um, uh, hold on, I had a question from the Google Meet. All right, before I'm going on any farther, I think I'm going to need to show you about the derivatives of these things. So, um, the derivative of Cauch is going to be, um, well, let's see. I'll just, I'll, I'll work through it. 1 half e to the x plus e to the negative x. Okay, well, I take the derivative of a half of something, it's going to be half of the derivative of the thing. So that's half of the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of e to the negative x is going to be negative e to the negative x. And look at that, that's cinch. So that shouldn't really be surprising. Wait, no, 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 that is the one that's supposed to be surprising, right? Because we're used to the derivative of cosine being negative sine, okay? And so I think that you could go through and it would not be surprising to you to find that the derivative of cinch is cosh. Uh, for the same reason, right? It's gonna be, that'll be minus the negative. So I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna do all of that. Um, the derivative of cinch x is cosh x. And I need a new black marker. It's just not getting the job done. Um, so I've got these derivatives, and you know, maybe I'm interested in the length of the of the graph. Why would I be interested? I saw this example on, on the internet. It was um, but I thought it was nice. It's like, why would I care about the length of the graph of Koch? Well, let me tell you why you would care about the length of the graph of Koch. Because that's the hanging wire, right? And moreover, you, you've seen these, uh, these suspended bridges before that, that have some sag to them. Those are going to hang in the shape, the shape of coach. And, you know, if you've got like a, um, some kind of like a gorge you need to span with a bridge so that, you know, people can safely cross, you're going to need to make sure that the length of the The, the, or the length of the curve is enough so that you can string it across the gorge, right? That, that would be the idea. Because, you know, if you have a bridge that doesn't reach all the way across the, the gorge, there's not much of a bridge, and, you know, why would you even build it? So, so I thought that was like, oh, you know, there's a reason why you would want to compute that arc length integral. So let's talk about arc length. Okay, suppose you've got, um, yeah, let's just say, y equals cosh x from 0 to 10? Maybe log 10? Is that a good idea? I don't know. Let's just say 0 to 10. So let's consider, you know, 
of y equals cosh x from, um, I'm going to say from, I'm just going to say on the closed interval 0 to 10. Okay, well, we know from last year that this length integral is going to be L equals the integral from 0 to 10 of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. Okay. Now dy dx is going to be cinch x. Okay. And 1 plus dy dx squared is going to be 1 plus cinch squared x, that and that's going to be cos squared x, and you see where I'm going here. So now this is equal to the integral from 0 to 10 of the square root of cos squared. That's good. We like that. And then we know an antiderivative for cosh, it's going to be cinch. So this is equal to cinch of 10. Okay? So this is an arc length integral that we can compute by hand, which I found like, I was like, oh, they'll appreciate that. Or if they don't, then I appreciate that because there's like this one and there's like 2 thirds x to the 3 halves um, is pretty integrable in that sense. Um, so, so there was that, and you know the hanging bridge problem. That was, you know, a problem definitely for someone else to solve, but uh, I could see how that would be interesting to a person. Next, I'm going to show you how to cook up an inverse function for sitch, or maybe cosh. I don't even remember. Um, okay, so if Let's say, hmm, can't, okay, yeah, you know, inverse of cinch. I did put it in my notes. Let f of x equal cinch x. And we're interested in finding an inverse, right? So we're going to, you know, find f inverse of y. So how we're going to do this is we're going to solve for x, but it's like we don't, I mean, I want an explicit formula for inverse cinch in terms of, uh, in terms of y or in terms of x or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that y equals cinch x, which is 1 half e to the x minus e to the negative x. And this is going to be a, you know, a little algebra trick here, but it's going to be just fine. You know the first step is going to be to multiply by 2. So 2y, and then I'm going to pull everything over to this side. So I've got an e to the negative x. Why do I have that? Oh, I guess I'm going to actually set this to 0 over here so it looks a little better. Um, I've got an e to the x. I've got a negative 2y, and I've got a negative e to the negative x. And now I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by e to the x. And then I'm going to notice that e to the 2x minus 2y e to the x minus 1. And then I'm going to notice that this is almost a perfect square in e to the x and y. Wait, so I multiply, oh, to get from here to here, mm -hmm. multiply both sides by e to the x. Okay. Now I'm going to do something uh, really tricky that I don't know that I would have seen to do this, but um, so it's e to the x minus y squared is almost what we have here. And we're off by just like the types of things that we could eventually right. just subtract after the fact, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say that if I squared this, I'd have e to the 2x. I'd have a positive y squared. And I don't have that, so I need to subtract y squared. But then I'd have negative 2y e to the x's, which is exactly what I have. I still have this negative 1 here. Now I'm going to start solving at e to the x, and it's now from here, this is very workable for us. It was just these couple of steps. You just wouldn't have, I, I don't think that I would have seen to do that unless I, you know, sat down and tried to spend a couple of hours doing this, okay? Um, I'm going to say that y squared plus 1 
equals e to the x minus y squared. And I can take the square root of both sides of this equation, and that will induce a plus minus. Plus minus square root of y squared plus 1 equaling e to the x minus y. And now I'm, you know, my idea is I'm solving for x here to try to find the inverse, and I'm getting closer. I mean, so I'm going to add this y over here. And then I'm going to take a second and think about what would happen if I had, um, if I had minus, right? I'm, I'm actually proposing this is, this is only plus. Let's think through what would happen if I had minus here. Um, it's going to turn into a negative. It is, exactly. The commentary from Google Meet was that it's going to turn into negative. And e to the x can't equal a negative number. Let's think through this, though. y squared plus 1 square rooted has to be bigger than y, right? Because the square root of y squared is going to be positive y. So that means it has to be bigger than y. So if this was a minus, I've got a negative number necessarily, and that's not possible, so I'm just going to, uh, done. Um, and now I'm just going to take the log of both sides. I'm going to say that x equals natural log of y plus the square root of y squared plus 1, meaning that inverse cinch is equal to this log, right? Um, so log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1, which I, I find interesting. We don't have just a um, such a nice formula for inverse sine and inverse cosine. We had to go look up, uh, we had to go look up on tables in the, in the old days or use a calculator to fi figure out inverse sine. Um, but this, you know, if you just have a place you want to figure out where cinch has that, you can do that. I find that to be pretty nice. Um, okay, so that's the thing about the inverse. The last thing I want to tell you is just kind of a teaser of something else that you could do with this. Um, I think I'm probably just going to, because I haven't talked to you all about the Euler identity, and I should, because, you know, this, again, this class should be a class in linear algebra, multivariable calculus, and odds and ends that should be in high school math that aren't, um, including Euler's identity. It's very useful. Um, but what I'm going to wrap up with here is I'm going to just mention that, let me see, let me make sure I'm not going to write this down. Okay, no, I want Koch of I times T is going to be equal to cosine of T. Is this I, like I as in yes, as in, as in the square root of negative 1, yes. Oh, no. Um, that, so somehow these things are friends in the complex world. And I think that this is where I'm going to stop. And I'm going to say that, you know, maybe later on in the semester I will talk to you a little bit more about complex variables. And this is the type of thing that we could investigate a little deeper. So I think that's all I've got for this video. Um,